We're ready. Ok. Hola, buenas tardes. Les damos la bienvenida al quinto seminario de otoño 2022 de la División de Recursos Hídricos y Medio Ambiente de la Universidad de Chile, los cuales se están realizando en formato online y abierto a toda la comunidad. Estos seminarios eh, son organizados por el Departamento de Ingeniería Civil y el Centro Avanzado de Tecnologías del Agua, CAPTA, de la Universidad de Chile. Y se transmiten por nuestro canal de YouTube, youtube.com barra FCFM. Les invitamos también a estar atentos a nuestras redes sociales como arroba DICUCHILE o a nuestra página web www.ingcivil.uchile.cl Mi nombre es Julia Wiener, soy, estudiante, soy investigadora postdoctoral del Departamento de Ingeniería Civil y me complace presentar en este quinto seminario eh, la participación del doctor Koshro Morovati Doctor en Hidrología y Recursos Hídricos de la Universidad de Xinhua, Beijing, en China. Esta presentación es parte del proyecto de cooperación internacional ANID NSFC 190025 eh, entre Chile y China, titulado Comparative Study on Water Food Energy Nexus at the River Basin Level in China and Chile, Reconciling Hydropower and Competing Water Uses. Este proyecto es liderado por los profesores Marcelo Olivares del Departamento de Ingeniería Civil de la Universidad de Chile y los profesores Tin Xu Su y Fu Qiang Qiang de eh, la Universidad de Tsinghua. Le voy a dar eh, la bienvenida eh, a nuestro orador, el doctor Koshro Morovati. Hello, doctor Koshro. Hello. Yes. Thank you for, for being with us today and um, You're welcome. This uh, seminar is uh, part of the project of international cooperation, uh, ANID NSFC 19.0025, um, named Comparative Study on Water Food Energy Nexus at the River Basin Level in China and Chile, reconciling hydropower and competing water uses, and led by professors Marcelo Olivares, Ting Shu Su, and Fu Qiang Qiang. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, please, uh, you can now um, project your presentation. Les okay. recordamos que al final de la sesión tendremos un espacio de 15 minutos para preguntas y respuestas y que pueden seguir la transmisión del evento a través de nuestro canal de YouTube. Thank you, Corsio. You can go ahead. No, no. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me for today's seminar between Tsinghua University and University of Chile. Today, I'm going to talk about one of the world's most crucial fishery lakes, Tonle Sap Lake, located in Cambodia, a Southeast Asian country. And the topic is contributions from climate variation and human activities to full regime change of Tonle Sap Lake in the last two decades. My today's presentation is divided into four main sections, starting with introduction, a brief outline about the Lansang Mekong River and Tonle Sap Lake. Lansang Mekong River is one of the world's most important transboundary rivers, influencing the economy of at least six Asian countries. As you can see in this figure, the river originates from China and passes through Myanmar, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia, and then it discharged into the South China Sea. Riparian countries in this uh, basin have already commenced harnessing its powerful flow for many purposes, such as irrigation for rice farming as the main source of income for most people living there power production industry, and also drinking. So water resource management in this area is much more than managing water. This contradictory statement is self-evident for dynamic Mekong Basin because the livelihood of people, at least 60 million people, directly depends on the flow in this area. Similar to the other transboundary rivers worldwide, the area has been influenced by two main drivers, human activities and climate variation. When we are talking about human act activities for this area, we are mainly focusing on dam construction and irrigation schemes as already some projects 
have been announced by the Parian countries. At the lower part of the Lansang Mekong River, Tonle Sap Lake is located, known as the most wetland, important wetland ecosystem in Southeast Asia, and one of very important for Cambodia for fishery and rice farming. This lake, the flow regime of this lake heavily depends on the Mekong River, uh, Mekong River. So when we are talking about this lake, we need to first address the role of the Mekong River because the Tonle Sap Lake is inseparable from the Mekong River's flow regime. This area supplies the livelihood of at least 2 million people. For example, annual harvesting of the fishery in this lake is around 2 million tons, valued at 2 billion US dollars. So it is very important for Cambodia first. This lake experience, experiences reverse flow phenomena. It means that water flows from uh, Mekong River to the lake. These phenomena start during heavy downpours from May to October. Through this phenomenon, a large portion of nutrient-rich sediment is transported into the, into the lake. So it increases soil fertility for rice farming and also it provides a rich habitat for spawning of fish, uh, maybe around 300 fish species. But during the non-reverse flow period, we have non-reverse flow. It means that the water flows from lake to the Mekong River. And through this phenomena, again, a large portion of nutrients is transported from lake to the Mekong River. So in this case, the Tonle Sap Lake is important for downstream countries like Mekong Delta to transport sediment and also more water during the dry season, which is important for rice farming and agriculture in this area. Similar to Lansang Mekong River, this process and also the, this uh, lake has been influenced by upstream human activities and climate variation. Because of upstream development, downstream countries blame upstream countries for current flow regime change. A factor blamed on construction of dams in the upper parts of the Mekong River, especially in China. For example, in recent decade, China constructed Xia Wan Dam and No Jadu Dams with a total capacity of greater than uh, 39 cubic kilometer, which is a very big project for China to produce power for uh, people around the river and also for other parts of China. Therefore, for such transboundary river, addressing the explicit attribution of the current flow regime shift is critical because when we address the questions like how much of the current flow regime change is attributed to China will help us to to, for sustainable regional management and also to establishing a couple of cooperation mechanisms among the riparian countries and also for transboundary water development. Therefore, we want to address how much of the current flow regime chain is attributed to the upstream countries of the lake, such as, for example, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and also China. But this is a challenging uh, study because so far all studies have focused on general trend. For example, how much of all hydropower dams from China to downstream countries have altered this flow regime? Now we want to develop a novel modeling setup to separate each upstream basin and address the impacts of each of them. So we developed three models. The first one was a hydrological model. The name is True Model, Tsinghua representative, representative Elementary Watershed. To separate the upstream basins, we use the last hydrological station of each country. For example, for China part, we use Jinghong Station located close to the boundary between Laos and China. We use these data, discharge data, as the inlet boundary for our hydrological model, which represents the human altered flow. 
We divided the upstream of the lake into two parts, China part and also Laos, Thailand and Vietnam as one area. The reason is that, as you can see in this figure, Mekong River and many tributaries span across the boundaries border. So it is impossible to, uh, to individually address each country. And we decided to consider these three countries together. We also developed a hydrodynamic model for the lake area. Our hydrodynamic model only covers the lake area. The reason is that for hydrodynamic model, simulation time is challenging. And if we consider the whole basin, for sure, it needs, it needs a very considerable simulation time. So we decided to decrease the simulation time by uh, following two approaches using multi block technique and also DD boundary technique. As you can see in this figure, we only covered rivers and also the lake, not the other parts. S similar to the other hydrodynamic models, we need to define main boundaries for our hydrodynamic model. First of all, inlet boundary. We need to define discharge time series uh, data for this boundary, and we get data for this boundary by uh, our developed hydrological model. Then for downstream, we define water level data at Chaktamak station close to the confluence when Mekong River and Tonle Sap River connects. And here is the question, how we can get the corresponding water level data for this uh, boundary influenced by the upper basin, for example, China. So this is the reason we developed a machine learning model to establish a reliable relationship between the inlet and outlet boundary to produce the data. One of the challenge for large scale basin for transboundary rivers is the lack of data. We do not have data for all uh, scenarios or maybe other all parts. Therefore, we need to integrate different models together. So we develop a hydrodynamic model, a 3D hydrodynamic model using Delft 3D flow. For this hydrodynamic model, we solve Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible flow. And also advection in momentum equations was completed using the cyclic method. This is very important for simulation time. So we did a, a, a sensitivity analysis for these parts. But why we develop a 3D hydrodynamic model? So the reason is that flow at some cross section of the lake and also river is quite deep. And therefore the flow velocity changed vertically and transversely. But the most important reason is that Rivers flow dominates the area, changing from river bottom to the water surface. And therefore we have to develop a 3D model. We also, as I said, uh, developed a machine learning model for uh, Tundi Sub Lake and Mekong River. You can see in the left side figure, the pattern of the rivers flow is different. And we have to, uh, find the similarities between these patterns. For this purpose and to find the similarities, we employ two classification algorithms, namely KNN and EBT models. Through employing these two models, we were able to find similarities between the patterns we can see in this figure. After distinguishing the reverse and non-reverse flow period by these, two, by these two classification algorithms, we redefined the discharge data for our inlet boundary to be used for ANFIS and LSDM models as the water level prediction models. After that, we were able to uh, estimate the water level for outlet boundary of our hydrodynamic model. So result uh, of our study, for example, for our hydrodynamic model in this figure, you can see that our hydrodynamic model has well simulated the exchange water between Mekong River and Tony Sub Lake. The average NSE is around 97%, which is quite high and uh, highlighting that 
uh, our model is reliable for further studies, not just for this part, but for uh, other similar systems around the world. In this figure also, you can see how our model has accurately simulated the rivers and non-rivers flow period from river bottom to the river surface. For our machine learning model, we defined our the last two decades into three parts, training, validation, and testing phases. So you can see that in testing phases, the accuracy is quite high. And uh, for example, the maximum difference for length of the reverse flow period is around two days. So it is very good uh, performance for our model because in this area, we have a lot of uncertainties for data and for water consumption in, for different sectors. After uh, defining the reverse flow period, we redefine the, uh, the discharge data for our inlet boundary for machine learning model. You can see in these two figures that our machine learning model has well captured the fluctuations and also the overall uh, profile of the water level in two critical stations, uh, which is important for uh, flow regime analysis in this area. The average NSE for these two uh, station is greater than 98%. In this figure also, you can see how accurate our hydrological model is. We calibrated and validated our model uh, from China to Cambodia for, here you can see six stations. And the produce discharge profiles follow relatively close to the measured one, almost the same accuracy in all stations. The average NSE for all station is greater than 92%. So these validation results confirm the reliability of our integrated models to be used for one of the most complicated uh, river lake system in the world. So after validation and uh, uh, checking the results, we defined five scenarios to separate the upstream basins and to address how each country uh, has influenced the flow regime in this area. First of all, we defined a baseline from 2001 to 2009 because we believe that, and according to many references, the flow regime in this area remained almost natural. For scenario number two, from 2010 to 2020, we address the climate variation by our hydrological model and also the observed data. For scenario number three, we address the impact of the increased human activities in China. What happened from 2010 to 2020 uh, in China and what was the impact for the flow regime in the lake. And scenario number four was related to increased human activities in the downstream parts. For example, in Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. Last one related to the combined impacts by all scenarios. What happens based on the observed data for all upstream human activities and climate variation from 2001 to 2010? So first of all, as I said in uh, previous slides, addressing these scenarios provides new insight into the role of upstream countries and climate variation on the Tunli South Lake flow regime in the last decade, which is important for uh, trans transboundary water management. So here, first of all, we address the what happened for Mekong River in the last decade, because as I said, Tunli South Lake is inseparable from uh, Mekong River. First, we need to address what happened for this transboundary river based on upstream human activities and climate variation. You can see that for water level and uh, discharge, similar patterns was obtained. Also, compared to the baseline period, we found that the peak discharge decreased by around 15%, which is, I think, very huge number. The low flow increased by approximately 30%. Here is a very important point. The upstream development 
decrease the peak discharge, but increase the low flow, the minimum flow during the dry season. I think this is one of the primary goals of the developing in infrastructures like hydropower dams, releasing more water during the dry season and storing water behind the dams during the wet season, flooding season to prevent the uh, flood, which is happily, which is um, usually happens in this area. It is, it is seen that China induced human activities dropped the in uh, the maximum discharge between 2% to 4%. But the downstream countries like Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand had a relatively greater negative impact from 3.5% uh, to 6%. So it means that China, Chinese impact are less pronounced compared to the downstream countries. And also the combined impact showed us that around 12% the uh, maximum discharge and water level uh, has decreased in the recent decade compared to the baseline period. In this figure also, you can see that the reverse flow, what happens for reverse flow? It is necessary here to mention that all uh, uh, water components for lake and also for flow regime analysis in this area uh, are addressed based on the length of the reverse flow. So accurately determining this interval is very, very important for, uh, for our study for this transboundary river. You can see in this figure that most more change for onset of the rivers. Here is the onset of the rivers full period and here is the end of the period. So here you can see that onset were influenced more than the end of the period. For example, the S4, which uh, represents the increased human activities in Laos and Thailand, decreased the reverse flow interval by nine days, so it is a lot. And also the combined impacts decreased the reverse flow interval by 12 days. Here you can, uh, we can say that the less the reverse flow interval, the less the transported discharge from Mekong River to the lake. This is the reason we need to address this uh, period very accurately. Also, graphs shows that the higher water level, uh, as far as I know, all the research conducted so far uh, calculated their uh, data, their findings based on this assumption that when water level in the Mekong River is higher than the lake, we have reverse flow. But our study showed something different. According to these profiles, you can see that when the water level in the Mekong River is higher than the lake, we do not have reverse flow. And the reverse flow onset changed maybe the difference between the higher water in the Mekong River, maybe one month or maybe less. But the point is they do not occur in the same time. So in this table, we, uh, we are presenting our major features for flow regime during a reverse flow period. Why we are focusing on reverse flow period, the reason is that during the reverse flow period, the lake is influenced, which is important for uh, the vulnerable communities living around the lake. You can see that uh, the combined impact decreased the total inflow into the lake from 88 cubic kilometer per year to around uh, 70, around 25% reduction. Also, you can see that between uh, for precipitation and evaporation, no significant variation is seen for uh, these two components. For Mekong River role, and also for tributaries around the lake, we have a lot of tributaries around the lake. Also, we can see that same contribution to the total inflow into the lake. This one is also important according to other research. 
they said that, for example, Mekong rule, Mekong rule is uh, much higher than the tributary, but our findings uh, was not in line with the previous research. Here you can see that the same role of both components, which are the main uh, drivers for total inflow during the reverse flow for the lake ecosystem. Here you can see also major features of the flow regime during uh, reverse flow related to lake uh, water level inundation area, which is very important for fishery and also lake volume. Lake volume is important for downstream, I mean, the Mekong Delta. So you can see that here compared to the baseline period to this one, uh, the combined impact in recent decade decreased the water level in the lake uh, around 18%. Inundation area decreased around 20% and also the lake volume decreased around 35%, which is huge numbers. Also, you can see that negative impact of China-induced activities is less pronounced compared to the downstream countries. So these results, these results uh, do, do not confirm the debates I presented uh, already in, our, in my previous slides that the downstream countries blame China uh, as the responsible for the current flow regime change in the downstream and also for the lake. But how about the Mekong Delta? As I said, the uh, Tony Sal Lake functions as a natural reservoir for the downstream area, especially for Mekong Delta during the dry season by providing more water and also sediments, which both are important for agriculture and also fishery. According to this uh, figure, the greatest contribution of the lake to the delta is attributed to December and January. In October, the contribution remained almost equal. But the point is for this, uh, for this figure is during the baseline period, around 31% of the drained water into the downstream area uh, originated from the lake. Climate variation decreased this value to 27%, around 4% reduction, percentage point reduction. China decreased further this uh, contribution to 25, and almost same contribution for Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. But the combined impact decreased the uh, drained water from lake to around 23%. These results confirms that the uh, recent development in China has less impacts than the downstream countries like Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. Major remarks that we can uh, present here for our study was that the validation showed that the developed modeling framework performed well and could therefore potentially be employed for Lansang Mekong River's upcoming studies and other floodplain experiencing rivers flow phenomena. Also, climate vari variability had changed the flow regime. Recent increased human activities in the upstream countries played an even larger role with more uh, neg with higher negative impacts attributed to, for example, downstream of China, not uh, to Chinese territory. Also, among the upstream countries, less negative impacts were attributed to China for all major futures of the lake. Our finding assessed in developing strategic plan formulation and decision uh, making processes on regional and transboundary rivers. For example, uh, the implication of the Lansang Mekong River Basin's development impacts and the flow regime shifts during uh, the flooding and dry season needs to be carefully addressed or considered when determining the level of investment uh, to place in uh, counteracting measures. For example, decreased Mekong River flow during the flooding season provides flood protection benefits 
whereas increased flow in the dry season provides more water for irrigation and other sectors. So this is the benefits of upstream development. However, the negative impacts associated with the less water discharged into the lake from Mekong River during the wet season uh, due to the upstream development should also be carefully considered as vulnerable communities live around the Tunli Sub Lake floodplain system. Lastly, these recent changes have threatened the Tunli Sub Lake ecosystem and these might even increase as the Lansang Mekong River Basin will experience more anthropogenic activities in the coming decades. Therefore, addressing future climate change and upcoming infrastructure development sustainably requires a balance between these trade-offs as Tunli Sub Lake is inseparable from the Mekong River. This is my two days presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Morabati. Um, I appreciate um, your presentation. Um, okay. I'll check if we have questions. Okay. Agradecemos la presentación del Dr. Morabati y, y estaré atenta a, a, a sus preguntas. In the meantime, I will ask mine. Um, so, I understood the major anthropogenic change from China um, is these um, dams and um, hydropower operations, is, if I understood well. And yes. what, what, are the, what are the type of, are, are there any other anthropogenic activities that you consider? And what are the ones in the other countries that, that you uh, used in your study? Yeah, this is actually a very good question. Thank you. So for large scale basins, uh, you know, we cannot find reliable data for all sectors, such as, uh, for example, irrigation, industry, sedimentation, sand mining, and also uh, dam operations because of security reasons. For example, for whole Mekong River Basin, the attributes of dams are available only for a uh, handful reservoirs. So considering these dams separately, will increase the uncertainty. So we did not follow this approach. When we are using the uh, observed flow as the last, uh, in the last hydrological station, these observed flow represent all types of human activities, not just dam operation. It includes irrigation, industry, drinking, sedimentation, everything. So we believe that this is more reliable than considering only one sector like dams, which we do not have enough information. For downstream areas, also we have same situation. We use the last hydrological station of each country. Am I clear? Yeah, yes, I understand yeah. it better now. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, have you considered analyzing lake level dynamics under climate change? Yes, yes, actually, in the table, let me show you. Uh, yeah, here, the, this is the lake area volume and also the, uh, the water level for climate change, human activities in China, and also uh, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam in scenario number four, and also the combined impacts of all uh, human activities and uh, climate variation. You can see here how uh, climate change uh, decrease the uh, inundation area in the lake, the lake volume, and also the lake water level. As I said, the, uh, uh, the greatest uh, reduction was attributed to increased human activities in Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam as a one area. Good. So overall, how much of the changes that you are seeing uh, would you say um, are contributed by climate change only, like separated? Uh, by climate change, so we need to talk about each component. Okay. You know, for, yeah, if we, for example, for water level, uh, because 
they are, uh, we calculated by different uh, techniques, rating curves, hydrodynamic model. Uh, so the results are different and maybe the sensitive sensitivity of each equation or each model. For example, for water level, you can see uh, for climate change, it's around maybe 10% between baseline and climate change. Okay, and also for human activities in China, approximately same result. Uh, for example, for downstream area, as I said, uh, yeah, here, you can see that climate variation decreased the, uh, the contribution of the lake by 4%, okay? And China induced human activities decreased further by two percentage point. So in this case, climate variation has greater impact than Chinese human activities or Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. So when we are addressing each of them, we need to, uh, we need to consider only one of the components, not general trend. All right. All right. Um, how did you take any bathymetric measurements? Yes, yes, exactly. This is also how a often? good question. Uh, actually, we for the lake area, we get data. We got data from a company. So because of security reason, we cannot uh, illustrate that data. For rivers, according to the MRC website, we have the configuration of the cross section for different stations. So I developed some models also for this one. I can show you the results. Uh, I already prepared some uh, slides. I expected some questions. So here you can see the accuracy of our developed model for uh, bathymetry data. This is for Nam Pen Por Station located on the Tunli Sab River. So we developed a DBM model. We developed digital bathymetric model based on uh, uh, measured, uh, can, uh, measured profiles for cross section in some stations for Mekong River and Tunli Sab River. But for the lake area, we had real data. Great. Um, this is another question. Apparently your model based on machine learning outperforms classical hydrologic models. Is, is that so? How could you explain such good performance? Uh, how I can explain uh, the good performance of these two models? Of the machine learning uh, model. So, yeah, for the good performance of the machine learning model, you know, this area is very complicated, you know, because of reverse flow, dominating the reverse flow phenomena in this area. So the reason is that we did not simply find a relationship between discharge and water level. First, we defined the the rivers flow, distinguish the rivers and now rivers flow period. Then we redefined, as I said, in this flow chart, you can see that we redefined the discharge data based on these two periods. After that, we found, we, we, we did find a relationship between discharge and water level. So this is the reason uh, our uh, machine learning model uh, performed quite well. Also, our machine learning model will, uh, performed very well for the downstream area, not our study area. Let me show you another figure for this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for example, for this one. This is Nam Pen Port Station, uh, which, is, which is located inside our study area and also the right one, but the uh, the uh, the blue one uh, is related to the station downstream of the our study area. So the R square is around I think ninety eight percent. It's quite high. Yeah, for our hydrological models also. So. Uh, yeah, the reason that our hydrological model performed very well. So as I said, I calibrated, validated the model for eight hydrological stations from China to the Tony Sub Lake. And we used very uh, reliable data for developing 
of this model. Thank you. Um, so uh, in, in relation with the previous question as well, did you model um, the lake and the, and the river that connects the lake with the, with the Mekong River? And, and also, did you model the tributaries? The exactly. Yes. Of the lake? yes. Yes, exactly. So you can see here, maybe I forgot to explain it. So here we have a lot of tributaries around the lake. Okay, so we employed our developed hydrological model to obtain the discharge time series data for these tributaries. We do not have continuous discharge data, um, observed data, I mean, for these tributaries. So this is another reason uh, uh, we developed our hydrological model uh, for this area. So I consider these tributaries as additional boundaries for our hydrodynamic model. Here, I think I only explained the inlet and outlet boundary. I forgot to have a discussion or explanations about these tributaries. That's fine. And, and so what's, what do you think is next for, for this model? And, and, and I mean, combination of models, like what, what uh, are the next questions that you think you can Answer. So, yeah, this is also a good question. Uh, so sedimentation is very important for this area, as I said in different slides. It influences the ecosystem of this area and also the downstream, for example, Mekong River, Mekong Delta in Vietnam. So in next stage, we are going to consider first sediment uh, and also the role of sediment in transporting water into the lake. This is another uh, main questions that we want to address for this area. All right, sounds very interesting. And I want to congratulate you on your work. Um, you. I don't think we have more questions. Let me check. No, we don't have any more questions. So uh, with that, I will thank you very, very much for your presentation Bravo. and your time. Eh, le agradezco al doctor Morovati su presentación y a ustedes eh, por acompañarnos esta tarde. Eh, les eh, vamos a dar por terminada la sesión del día y los esperamos el próximo 23 de junio para un próximo seminario. Que tengan todos muy buenas tardes. Thank you, doctor Morovati. You are welcome.